This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present to you part 5 of the chapter about induction machines. In this part, I will cover the starting and speed control of induction machines. At starting, the motor is initially at standstill and thus its speed is zero. So the slip is unity. The problems with this situation are the high starting current, which is dangerous and can easily damage the motor. This current can reach up to 10 times or even more the rated current. The low starting torque, which cannot start the loaded motor as fast as we desire. To conduct a safe starting of the motor, it is recommended to reduce the starting current to a low and safe value. According to this starting current equation shown here, it is clear that in order to perform a starting with reduced starting current, we should consider reducing the terminal voltage or increasing the rotor resistance. Let us first see what happens if we start the motor with reduced stator voltage. We know that the starting and maximum torques are proportional to the square of the voltage, so both will be affected and will decrease when the voltage is reduced. Therefore, the induction motor torque versus speed characteristic will change as shown here if the terminal voltage is reduced from one value V1 to another value V2 or V3. We can reduce the voltage at starting using the following three methods. The first method uses one step starting auto transformer where the running contactor R is open while the starting contactor S is closed, thus connecting low voltage side of the auto transformer to the terminals of the motor. Here the starting contactor is opened and R is closed after the motor starts completely. This method allows only two voltage values. The second method is the star delta starting. In this case, we need to have six terminals of the three phase stator windings available in the terminal box, junction box of the motor. These windings are first connected in star to reduce the phase voltage. And then after starting the motor, the connection is changed to delta using two positions switch as shown in this figure. This method also allows only two voltage values. The third possible method of reducing the terminal voltage of the induction motor is to use a solid state voltage controller for starting. This is nowadays the mostly used method and is called soft starting method. The voltage can be increased gradually from zero till rated voltage. Now, if we start the motor by increasing the rotor resistance, the motor speed characteristics will change differently from the reduced voltage starting method. To increase the rotor resistance, we need to use an additional external rotor resistance that is connected in series with the wound type rotor winding. By increasing the rotor resistance, the torque speed characteristics of the motor change as shown here where R additional 2 is larger than R additional 1. In this case, we notice that the starting current is reduced, which is good. The starting torque is increased, which is also good. The maximum torque is unchanged, which means that the motor acceleration is high. And the speed at maximum torque is reduced, which, also, which is also desired because we can bring the maximum torque to zero as shown in this case where we added R additional 2. Now after the motor starts, the external resistance is usually short circuit so that only the rotor winding resistance remains. For a squirrel cage rotor type induction motor, since we have no access to the rotor and we cannot connect external rotor resistance, we can have a variable rotor resistance using a special design of the cage bars. We can design deep bars or double cage bars. 
Since the frequency of the rotor current is high during motor starting, and because of skin effect, the current will tend to flow on the higher surface of the bar with a smaller cross-section leading to high rotor resistance. However, after the motor starts, the rotor frequency decreases and the current will flow in a larger cross-section of the bar leading to a smaller rotor resistance. According to the criteria of the U.S. National Electrical Manufacturing Association, NEMA, the square cage motors are classified into class A, B, C, or D. The torque speed curves and the design characteristics for these classes are shown in this figure and table. Let us analyze these classes. Class A motors have normal starting current and torque and rated slip below 5%. Class B motors have low starting current and normal starting torque with rated low speed below 5% also. The Class C motors have low starting current and high starting torque with rated low slip below 5% also. While Class D motors have low starting current and very high starting torque but have also higher rated low slip ranging between 8 and 13%. So, Class D motors are most suitable for starting safely and faster the underrated supply voltage and full load. Now, let us move to the induction motor speed control techniques. According to the speed equation, the speed can be controlled by varying the synchronous speed of the rotating field, which can be adjusted or changed by changing the frequency or the number of poles. The speed can also be changed by controlling the slip S when varying the stator voltage, rotor resistance, or rotor voltage, which is called also slip energy recovery. Let us see briefly how the speed control techniques or methods can be performed. As I mentioned earlier, the synchronous speed can be controlled by changing the supply frequency or the number of poles. Changing the frequency can perform continuous variation of the speed, while changing the number of poles allows only step variation of the speed because the number of poles can only take discrete values. Now, let us see how we can control the speed by changing the number of poles. And we'll consider an example of doubling the speed of an 8-pole induction machine. Note that for each phase, we first need to have four windings. We can connect the windings in series, as shown here, to get 8 poles in the machine. If you connect the winding in parallel, as shown in this figure, then we can obtain four poles only. Now the following is another example showing another machine with two windings per phase which allow the, to get four poles for the series connection and two poles for the parallel connection. So for these two examples we can have only two speeds of rotation of the induction motor. For more than two speeds change more windings like those above are required. Therefore, the machine becomes bulky, heavier, and more expensive. So we can conclude that this is not a very practical way of controlling the speed. Now let us see how we can control the motor speed by changing the frequency of the stator supply voltage. When the frequency is increased alone, the synchronous speed increases but the starting and maximum torques decrease, which is not good. The torque speed characteristics, when the frequency is varied, are illustrated in this figure. Notice that when the frequency increases, the torque decreases and the speed increases. This is not desired because both the starting and maximum torques of the motor decrease. Moreover, since the stator flux is proportional to the ratio of the voltage and frequency. If we decrease the frequency only while keeping the voltage high, the flux may saturate 
and affect the dynamic performance of the induction motor. But if you vary the voltage simultaneously with the frequency so that the ratio of the voltage over frequency called V by F is kept constant, then the variations of the starting and maximum torques are less significant as illustrated by this figure and equations. Notice that the maximum torque does not vary much while the starting torque varies considerably. So by controlling the ratio V over F constant, we can control the speed of the motor while keeping almost constant the slip and the maximum torque. This is considered an efficient speed control technique since the efficiency of the motor is affected by the increase of the slip. The control of voltage and frequency can be performed using an inverter, which is a power electric converter, as shown in this figure. From a fixed AC voltage source, we can convert it to a DC power through rectifications using AC-DC converter. Then the DC power is converted to a variable voltage and frequency AC power to feed the induction motor using the inverter. All these power converters are based on power electronic devices and circuits. In some and few applications, the speed of the induction motor can be controlled by varying just the stator voltage. Since the torque is proportional to the square of the voltage, the torque speed characteristics when the voltage is reduced take these shapes. If, for instance, we have this load characteristic, the operating point will move from point 0.1 to point 0.2 if the stator voltage is decreased from V1 to 0.75 or 75% V1. Notice that in point 0.2, the speed of the motor has decreased and thus the slip has increased. Decreasing the voltage further will increase the slip further and hence decrease the speed further. So as you can notice, we can control the slip by controlling the terminal voltage. The control of the voltage can be performed using a variable transformer or power electronics converters as shown in this circuit. Varying the voltage alone is not an efficient way of speed control because, as I mentioned earlier, the efficiency of the motor is affected by the slip. We can also control the slip through control of the rotor voltage or what is called also the slip energy recovery. This can be applied for wound rotor or slip ring type machines only because it requires accessibility to the rotor circuit. In the classical technique, we connect the rotor terminals to a three-phase variable external resistance. The rotor external resistance increases the total rotor resistance, which in turn increases the slip and thus decreases the speed. In principle, we are controlling the amount of power converted to mechanical power by controlling the rotor losses and slip energy. As we have seen earlier, when we studied the starting of the machine, the increase of the rotor resistance will change the torque speed characteristics as shown here. The advantages of such a method are simplicity, and it is also very useful at starting, while it produces high starting torque and low starting current. On the other hand, it has some drawbacks, which are low efficiency because of extra losses, slow control response, and imbalance problems if the three-phase resistors are not equal. The slip energy control is therefore conducted through rotor resistance control. The more energy we dissipate in the rotor resistance, the less energy goes to the shaft, and thus the motor speed decreases. An alternative method of varying the rotor circuit resistance is to use a three-phase diode bridge in combination with a single variable resistance instead of three. So in this case, some of the energy is extracted from the rotor and dissipated as heat inside the external resistance. 
Note that this method exhibits also low efficiency. Another more efficient method is to recover the energy extracted from the rotor and to return it back to the power source as shown in this circuit. This method is known as the slip energy recovery method, which allows a more efficient control of the slip energy and hence the slip. In all cases, compared to synchronous speed controls, slip control is much less efficient. This will be demonstrated in the next slide. If we neglect all copper and rotational losses, we can write the efficiency as a function of the slip as given by this equation. Because the efficiency of the motor is approximately proportional to 1 minus s, any method of speed control that depends on the variation of the slip is inherently inefficient. We can conclude by confirming that the most efficient method of speed control is by changing the voltage, amplitude, and the frequency at the same time. This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching this video.